Welcome to Forecast Lab once again for your Friday edition. We are watching the departure of Hurricane Fiona. It is almost off the chart there, but a pretty good network of isobars showing up around Nova Scotia, and it will be heading up into this area this evening. Let me take you to the NHC product for Fiona. There it is at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Still a very dangerous storm. Look at that, 125 miles an hour. It's just dropping out of Category 4 into the high end of Category 3, moving quickly to the north, northeast, 40 miles an hour there. And the central pressure, still 940 millibars. It did bottom out at 932 millibars, which is the deepest pressure in the temperate latitudes of the North Atlantic that we've observed since 1979. So far, the tally on the storm, $100 million in damage, six deaths, with four of those in Puerto Rico. Now, there will be some significant impacts in Canada this evening, especially in eastern Nova Scotia near Sydney, far western Newfoundland, and around St. Pierre. Now, this is the peak wind gust product from w WX Charts, and this is calibrated in knots. So let's look at the forecast there. You can see it coming north. Very strong wind bands into eastern Nova Scotia. And those appear to be peaking at about 70 to 90 knots, maybe a few peaks up near 100 knots. So those will be some very significant impacts for that part of Canada. Anyway, let's go ahead and move on and look at the U.S. The weather map for this afternoon does show a transition into fall-like patterns. Iowa in the 50s this afternoon, some mild conditions across much of the eastern U.S., and likewise some mild air flowing into the Great Basin area and central Rockies. And as we move into the fall months, we need to start considering air masses, and we've got a bunch of them. Where do they come from? What's their source region, and how would we characterize them? Well, in New Mexico and Texas, that's some dry, very warm air. So using the old classification scheme of air masses, that would be continental tropical, and this is air that we usually have behind the dry line. The tropical air, I'm going to paint that uh, green, if I can get my pen to come up. There we go. So that's the influx of tropical air little nose up there into central Nebraska. Then we have some fresh Pacific air coming in across Nevada, Utah, Wyoming, the Dakotas, and this old Canadian polar air mass in the eastern U.S. And it's not just the temperature, it's also the dew points. And look at those dew points in the 30s and 40s, very dry, refreshing air. At least I would consider that refreshing here in Texas. Unfortunately, we've got 50s and 60s dew points, so that's not going to work for me. Let's take a look at the upper air chart. Haven't seen this in a while, have we? Some of the old timers probably remember this from about three or four years ago. We used to use this graphic quite regularly. This is from Environment Canada, and this shows the jet stream, the 250 millibar patterns up near the top of the troposphere, so let's go ahead and check it out. Very active jet stream pattern into the Gulf of Alaska. That's going to be it right there. And that originates from the Kamchatka Peninsula of Siberia. Usually a very stormy area as we go into the cold season. And we split it up into this split flow pattern right there. The most energetic part in the Canadian Maritimes. So that's sucking Fiona northward. And then we've got this other band with an outgoing polar system in the Midwest and in the East Coast region. And I think it is important to consider the subtropical highs, especially in late summer. So there's going to be a little ridge axis right there. You can see that the flow north of that is out of the west. So that's the band of prevailing westerlies. And on the other side, we've got easterly flow through the Gulf of Mexico into South Texas. So what does that mean? Some very warm weather from Texas all the way to Alabama. And this southerly flow in Arizona is helpful for monsoon 
storms. As long as the air mass is not depleted of moisture, that can bring an infusion of new moisture north out of old Mexico. And yes, they are getting some monsoon action again, especially in the low deserts north of Yuma, out around Bullhead City, not quite as far north as Kingman, but there it is in the low deserts. Typically, we see these storms on the Mogollon Rim, so it is noteworthy when they start appearing out in the lower deserts. So let's take a look at those temperatures for this afternoon. These are the forecast highs. Looking at 100 at Waco, 98 at Houston, and a little pocket of warm weather in southern Florida where they have 94 at Fort Myers, tying the record for the date. For tomorrow, Saturday, the heat continues in East Texas, the Arklatex, and around Shreveport. Widespread mid-90s. Don't see any 100-degree temperatures, but it will be pretty warm for this time of year. Then for Sunday, some moderation of the heat, 97 there in southwestern Arkansas. Starting a new week for Monday, September 26th, some heat showing up around Olympia. That's going to be just southwest of Seattle. Also warming up in the deserts north of Los Angeles and a little bit of 91 degree heat there in Galveston. For Tuesday, seasonable temperatures. Same thing on Wednesday. And same thing on Thursday. So in terms of temperatures, no real problems, but we are going to have one wild card coming out of the south, out of the Gulf of Mexico. Let's take a look at that. And that is tropical depression number nine. I thought that was going to become Hermine, but this system here off of Africa snagged the name. So I think we're looking at Ian, unless this one gets going. So we'll see what happens once it gets named, but this could be Ian. And anybody that's paid attention to the news is probably aware of this. Major hurricane forecast around midweek, Wednesday or Thursday, off of western Florida. There's the composite of all the forecast solutions for this storm. And you can see that there's really good grouping all the way into western Cuba. After that, it starts fanning out a little bit and becoming less clear. However, it is heading for somewhere in or around Florida. And it's very advisable to do your preparations and shopping right now. Because if you're in ground zero where the track is headed, the stores are going to be very empty of key supplies. And I would plan based on that assumption. All right, let's check it out on the GFS. We can use that same trick that we used on Fiona and watch the approach of the wind bands. Now, of course, this is the deterministic solution, and there's a lot of assumptions here. But the current forecast is looking like this bringing the heaviest winds just west of Tampa and up into northern Florida. Now, I would not plan specifically on this outcome, but this is one potential scenario. And of course, if this goes up into this region, there's going to be some impressive storm surge along with that because the combined forward speed of the storm and the south to north wind flow, that's just going to pile up a whole mess of water right there in that part of Florida. Okay, we did not take our trip up to Canada yet, so we still need to do that. Let's head up there. Obviously, this air mass is of Pacific origin. This moved onshore kind of like that. And then further up north, yeah, that air mass is also probably of Pacific origin as well. And some strong onshore flow there in the southeastern Alaska region from Yakutat all the way down towards Juneau. And some rather fall-like conditions, temperatures in the 50s and 40s. And starting to see some snow up there in northern Canada. Powerful 982 millibar low up there near Coppermine. And we're getting that snow coming down around Victoria Island, down into the area around Great Slave Lake. Then heading out east. This is a pretty good tongue of cold air right there. Temperatures down in the 20s. And the thickness band, the 540 decameter thickness ribbon, is right there plunging south 
showing the extent of that cold air down into Quebec, and more thickness contours all the way up towards northern Baffin Island. So there's some good cold air starting to settle in across northern Canada. Yeah, this is a chart we have not seen in a while. This is the 850 millibar temperature with the pressure, the height lines on the chart as well. So you can see there's this little axis of cold air flowing down into Quebec as we start the sequence and more cold air bottled up in the Arctic region of North America. So over the next week, you can see that cyclone up there in northern Canada spinning, and it slings some cold air south into the Great Lakes area. That'll be arriving early next week and making its way into the northeastern U.S. And you can see the forecasted hurricane somewhere around Florida approaching what's going to be troughing. Now, typically when we have strong troughing north of a tropical cyclone, that tends to lift it north. But for whatever reason, it just wants to keep the tropical cyclone right around western Florida for a few days and then bring it north. But, you know, we're getting into some very granular detail too far out. This is like the first day of October. So we'll just wait and see how this plays out. But for the time being, this stuff up here should be rather accurate. It looks like a few outbreaks of cold air coming into the northeastern U.S. and remaining summer-like in the central and western U.S. A quick look at the Canadian Maritimes as nighttime falls on the area. The winds are picking up, seeing it as high as 35 knots at this time, and they should come up significantly in this area right here. So that'll be something to watch. You can follow this either through Digital Atmosphere, my own program, or go to Aviation Weather Center and go to the METAR page, and you'll be able to get these maps and watch the system make its way inland. And a look around selected parts of the country. Texas has the start of some onshore flow right there. Looks like some tropical moisture coming north. Kind of a hazy appearance within that cumulus. And then as you go further out to the west, we get back into that post dry line air, and that's that continental tropical air mass that we talked about earlier. In the Gulf Coast region, not a whole lot of convective activity, mostly focused around Tampa and Orlando, Vero Beach. That's going to be along a stagnant frontal boundary, and then up north, rather clear conditions, and that kind of shows you that impact we've had of that dry, cool air that's flowed southward. The clouds are on the increase in the Midwest region. Big old thick cirrus and alto stratus, stratocumulus, all piled up there from central Illinois to Indianapolis. And that's a classic cool season type of weather pattern. That's going to be north of that warm front that we discussed earlier. The warm front located somewhere in this area right here. You can see the easterly flow north of that. And... A lot of dynamic lift occurring just north of that boundary. And there's a look at the main system there in the Dakotas. The center of the circulation appears to be around Fargo. And then out here we've got the so-called overrunning, the isentropic lift. And on the backside, cold air advection and cool mid-level temperatures helping to produce cloud fields in that area. And even some convective development in northeastern South Dakota. And one more stop, the western U.S. It looks like they've put all the fires out, at least most of them. We had a lot of smoke out there last week, but clear as a bell across northern Nevada and southern Oregon. And now the time has come for me to get this rendered and uploaded. Got to do all the video editing work and get it posted on YouTube. So let's go ahead and do that. Just as a reminder, we do depend heavily on your support to keep this channel going. So if you have not become a Patreon supporter, please consider that. And you can also pick up a copy of my book there on weathergraphics.com. I actually got several books. Check that out and uh, all of that will help support the program. And uh, that'll make sure that I'm able to spend more time during the day doing this rather than other projects like programming and that kind of thing. Although it is important, 
I'm sure a lot of you would prefer to see more of this program. So keep that in mind. And if you can head over to Patreon and help support the program, it would be very much appreciated. We'll go ahead and leave you with some footage now from Greg. This is San Antonio just a couple of days ago. Out there on the west side, a lot of construction going on. San Antonio expanding westward into the foothills. And that's a look at that. Hope you have a great weekend. And we'll see you back here on Monday for the supporters and Wednesday for everybody else. Take care. Bye-bye.